Welcome to the lecture on alchemical free energy calculations. My name is Bert Groot and together with Vitas Gapsis uh, we'll be um, having two lectures as well as a practical session on free energy calculations. I will start off with um, a more general introduction into the concepts um, and afterwards um, Vitas will have a presentation um, more focused on applications and examples and then we'll be equipped with the tools to be able to carry out such calculations ourselves in the following practical session. Alright, so why are we interested in free energy calculations at all? Um, and um, in particular, of course, alchemical free energy calculations, but let's have a look at free energy calculations or free energies in general. Um, you may know that, in fact, um, all sorts of properties of molecules that we are interested in are, in fact, free energies. So, for example, affinities are free energies. For example, if we are interested in binding um, affinities, um, ligands binding to a receptor, protein-protein binding, the affinity um, that we express in nanomolar or so is actually a free energy of binding. Same thing for stabilities. If we say a system is very stable, um, for example, a protein is very stable against unfolding, that's a stability of um, folding, and this is a, a free energy of the folded state as compared to the unfolded state. And um, um, another example is in fact um, a conformational transition rates. So if we think about a barrier that needs to be overcome, this is also a free energy barrier uh, determining the rate of, for example, a reaction we might be interested in or a, a permeation rate for a, a channel. Um, and which may in fact come from something like a, a potential of mean force or PMF and can be computed with different uh, methods. This is a free energy profile right, from which we can, for example, learn uh, the permeation characteristics of the channel. Um, and um, uh, so this is the reason why we are interested in um, free energies. And there is a, a practical mm -hmm. advantage as well. It has to do with the way how we compute these properties. And um, uh, free energies happen to be um, uh, more tractable to compute from, for example, MD cal calculations than other thermodynamic quantities. So um, not only is free energy important because it drives many of the processes that we're interested in, uh, but they are also um, uh, relatively easy, easily um, tractable uh, to calculate. So which flavors of free energy calculations are there? Well, um, you may have guessed there are many because of the, um, uh, the importance of, of, of being able to estimate free energies. And so we, are, um, we have these different um, possibilities. Um, we have um, um, first principles based, uh, first principles meaning based on the first principles of statistical mechanics. Then um, we have a more statistical based methods, and these can be either uh, ligand based or, or protein structure based. And then we have hybrid methods that somehow uh, combine uh, the pros of both. And those again can be purely statistical. So you may have heard of Rosetta, for example, that uses a statistical force fields to estimate um, uh, free energies. And then there is also um, more heuristic methods um, using um, uh, regression models and, and um, MMPBSA, for example, are examples of that. Today we'll be focusing on uh, first principle based um, and I'll explain a little bit what kind of methods there are. So we can use either a spontaneous um, um, free sampling and then uh, using the Boltzmann formula we can also use different forms of biased sampling, so we can use enhanced sampling like metadynamics that you have already heard about uh, earlier this week. Um, uh, we can also use uh, things like umbrella sampling, I'll explain in a minute what that is. Um, but um, we can also use uh, alchemical approaches and that will be the focus of, of uh, today, uh, which can either be in an equilibrium setting, 
um, those are the traditional alchemical free energy calculation methods or um, uh, today we can also use non-equilibrium approaches and they'll explain how that works and we'll also apply that later today. Um, so um, a little bit on the statistical, mechanical or thermodynamic background on free energies. As I already said, free energy is a, is a thermodynamic property. We can write it as um, done here, G equals H minus TS, meaning uh, the free energy here, the Gibbs free energy, is um, defined as the enthalpy of the system or the internal energy minus the temperature times the entropy. Another way of writing um, the Gibbs free energy is uh, minus kt times the logarithm of the partition function. Um, um, a, a third definition, which is actually very handy, is the so-called Boltzmann equation that relates the probability, pi, of um, finding a state. Uh, it relates it directly to the um, free energy by this exponential formula. So the probability of finding a state is uh, proportional to the e to the minus uh, um, uh, the, uh, the free energy of the states uh, divided by the thermal energy, kT. And um, um, so these are, are different ways to compute the free energy. And as we can already see from this Boltzmann formula that relates the um, probabilities to the free energy, if we are lucky enough and we we find all the states sampled spontaneously in, for example, an MD simulation. Um, we can just see how probable each state is and from um, just doing the exponential um, uh, counting we know the uh, free energy from applying this Boltzmann formula. Um, if we are not so um, um, lucky and um, uh, finding the states being sampled um, uh, spontaneously. We can, of course, bias the system. We can either um, introduce a perturbation in an alchemical way, and I'll come to that in a minute. It will also we can also apply a perturbation in the form of an umbrella potential, or a Gaussian potential in the uh, case of metadynamics, and we can um, uh, use non-equilibrium methods such as Sierzynski and Crookes, and um, I'll um, uh, explain how that works um, afterwards. So let's first go to the uh, most straightforward case where we can um, just in equilibrium sampling already visit all the states that we're interested in. So let's consider this case of a, um, here we see the, as a function of time, the deviation of a small peptide uh, RMS deviation from a folded helical structure. And at uh, room temperature, in the upper plot, we see that it's mostly um, sampling low RMS D values, meaning it's close to this helical state. And then occasionally it shows a higher RMS D value, meaning it's unfolding to um, a, a different state there. We now raise the temperature, uh, go to 340 Kelvin, in the lower plot, uh, we then um, see that it's um, uh, folding and unfolding all the time, and it's spending almost uh, an equal number of uh, 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 time in the folded and the unfolded state. So from the Boltzmann formula, we can already see that the folded state must be the most probable and therefore the lowest free energy state at uh, room temperature, whereas at 340 Kelvin, uh, the situation has changed and the folded and unfolded state have almost equal uh, probability and therefore uh, they have equal free energy, which also means we must be close to the folding temperature there uh, because um, yeah, we have the folded and unfolded state in equilibrium at almost equal probability. Um, now that we can apply this formula, we can also look in somewhat more detail. So here we look at the principal component pr trajectory, uh, a projection of the same trajectory, and we see these dense spots from for which we also see uh, snapshots. So the densest region in red is actually the folded helical structure, 
then we have an associated state which is folded from one side but not yet from the other and then we have a third spot which is more like a hairpin structure which is de disconnected from all the rest and then we have this diffuse cloud of um, other structures which is in fact the um, a collection of unfolded structures and the um, color code um, gives us the local phase space density meaning um, uh, the uh, brightly red colored states have high density meaning low free energy and this is obviously true for the um, uh, folded helical state and, and for these other states whereas uh, in blue we see um, a collection of unfolded states meaning all of these individual states have a higher um, uh, free energy and only together do they uh, show an appreciable probability to be there. Um, we can also um, express this probability of being in a state in on a different axis, this is we, what we do here on the vertical axis and then we again very clearly see um, that there are um, these three states with the lower free energy uh, here in blue and um, states with higher free energy in, in green and, and in red so that's where the density of, of the probability of finding those states is, is very low um, and on the right hand side we also see the effect of temperature um, so where in the um, uh, at room temperature, as we saw before, the system is mostly folded, meaning it mostly is sitting in these low free energy basins, whereas at 340 Kelvin, where we're closer to the um, folding temperature, we spend almost equal amounts of time also in the unfolded state, meaning that these folded uh, minima are less populated. Okay. Um, now, what if we're not so lucky, and what if we are not um, uh, visiting all the states that we're interested in spontaneously by just running along in this simulation? Well, we can help the system somewhat, um, but of course then we have to worry about um, how we are biasing the system. And in the case of umbrella sampling, what we do is um, we are interested to um, extract an underlying free energy profile such as done here um, the, the, the red profile is what we uh, would be uh, interested in um, um, the, the barrier that we see here this delta G might be too high to overcome in a microsecond long simulation so um, what we can do is we can um, force the system to overcome this barrier and um, this is for example shown on the right hand side um, here we are um, looking at uh, uh, this blue molecule could be an uh, ammonia molecule sitting in water that we want to push through a channel um, now the ammonia might have a high permeation barrier so it might not want to go through spontaneously but we can apply an additional harmonic potential the green one uh, to the system to force it basically anywhere where we want the molecule to be and we can also force it to very high free energy regions um, now um, um, that solves half of the problem so then we have the system where we want it to be but of course we have artificially change the probability of being there so we cannot just apply the Boltzmann formula like we did before we somehow have to take into consideration the bias that we applied to get the molecule there in the first place now the advantage is we know exactly what we did to that molecule we know the um, harmonic potential that we applied we know how we were biasing the system so we can unbias the probability densities for exactly that additional potential and get the, um, um, the, the unbiased uh, or reconstruct the unbiased um, free energy profile that way. Uh, one method of doing that is the weighted histogram analysis method or also one and that is frequently used to um, in conjunction with umbrella sampling to extract free energy profiles from a uh, set of MD simulations. 
Um, now let's switch to alchemical methods, uh, which uh, traditionally are known as free energy perturbation or thermodynamic integration methods. There, um, the situation may be somewhat similar. So we're looking at the barrier here, for example, of the um, the barrier of uh, binding a molecule to a receptor, and again that may be a, a barrier that is too high to overcome on short time scales. So we um, um, uh, we want to do something about it. Uh, we could, of course, again apply something like umbrella sampling to overcome this barrier and to go from the unbound state to the bound state and vice versa and compute the associated um, free energy profile and from the difference between bound and unbound we would then know the affinity of the binding of this molecule to the receptor. Um, what we can also do is uh, say, well, we're actually not so interested in the whole profile and the barrier height and, and so on and the whole binding unbinding process. We just want to know is the, um, the we want ju just to know the affinity. So is the molecule, um, uh, the difference in free energy basically between the bound and the unbound state. And we, do we are not necessarily interested in all the in-between states on the binding pathway. Um, what can we do in such a case? Well, um, here we can um, uh, think of it in terms of a perturbation of the system. And um, we can, uh, for example, define the uh, bound state as um, um, uh, associated with the uh, variable uh, lambda, call it um, um, zero in the bound state and one in the unbound state. We can also define actually the difference between two ligands and call them A and B. And then we call uh, lambda equals zero uh, would be um, uh, one ligand, state B um, with lambda equals one would be associated with um, uh, a second uh, lambda value uh, here, lambda equals one. Um, and the nice thing about um, uh, computational physics is that um, this is now a coordinate lambda switching between two states for which we can define a free energy value. Um, so here we um, uh, integrate um, for lambda going from 0 to 1 um, and the, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda and if we would um, sample that um, change of lambda we would have the um, uh, associated free energy change. Now uh, we can do this in one go, um, that would be called uh, perturbation. We can also um, do this within between steps. Um, uh, if we um, uh, then do the integration as follows, uh, that would be called um, uh, thermodynamic integration. Um, either way, this is an alchemical change and um, um, some of you should become very skeptical now because uh, we know that experimentally um, alchemy has not been very successful. Uh, it has been tried very hard over many centuries and it was never successful experimentally. So um, um, there should be a healthy concern about whether it's possible to do this at all. Um, and the good news is that computationally this is not a problem at all. So we can easily create a, um, a nitrogen out of nothing or we can change um, uh, lead into gold or uh, carbon into oxygen. This is all fine because physically it's well defined how to do that and what is the associated um, energy and free energy change. It's just that experimentally it's not so um, readily accessible. Uh, but there's no reason why we should not apply this computationally and this is actually an advantage of doing simulations. Now there's one question here. Um, if we look at the formula um, and uh, especially if we remember the previous formula um, here on um, uh, uh, the one 
right here at the bottom left uh, G equals H minus TS so the free energy is an um, enthalpy term minus the temperature times an entropy term if we now go back um, here uh, what we have is free energy is an integral over um, the internal energy. This is the it's a different H now. It's a uh, Hamiltonian, but basically with a very similar uh, meaning. Uh, so we just look at the uh, derivative of the internal energy with respect to lambda, and that should give us a free energy. So where is now the minus T S term? Is the question. Um, I will claim that this formula is correct. We are not neglecting the minus T S term. I'll just leave it um, to um, the discussion afterwards. Uh, if somebody has any ideas, if not, you can also ask me. Um, but if there are any ideas where this um, minus T S term comes in, if in principle, we are only looking at the integral over the internal energy here. All right. Um, now, how does this work in practice? Let's first look at perturbation. Um, uh, what we do here is we apply the so-called Zwanzig formula, which means that we look at the difference in the uh, internal energy. So we would simulate, for example, um, uh, state A, um, and we would compute the energies in state A, but we would also compute the energies in case the system would be in state B. Yeah, so say state A is molecule 1 and state B is molecule 2. Um, we would um, uh, compute uh, our whole simulation ensemble for molecule 1, but we could also uh, think, well, what would, what would have been the energy if uh, in, in this particular state uh, we would have actually had molecule 2. And this is uh, how we then define the free energy, as the we compute the difference between um, the two energies, take the exponential average over that, um, this, uh, uh, and call that the free energy. And of course, um, by symmetry, we could have done that also the other way around. So we could have simulated also in state B and computed the energies for state A, and both would give the same uh, free energy change. And this works very uh, successfully. In the case, uh, as here in the lower left, where we have sufficient overlap. Yeah. So if the two molecules are rather similar, sample um, similar states, then that means uh, we have um, we can apply this formula without any restrictions and get an accurate estimate of the free energy. Of course, things become more problematic if the molecules are very different. Um, then they would also want to sample different states, meaning that the states that we sample for um, one of the molecules is not representative anymore for the other molecules, and then uh, we would be uh, making severe errors. Um, but there's a, an easy way out, of course, in such a case. We just define a number of intermediate states and then apply the same formulas in, in series. Um, we can still uh, apply the perturbation um, formalism here uh, every time between neighboring states that are sufficiently overlapping and then just propagate um, through all the differences to get our final free energy difference. Um, we can also do it uh, in a continuous way, like we've shown with the integral before. Um, there we don't um, use the difference between the um, energies anymore, but we just um, look at infinitesimal small changes of lambda and compute the derivative of h with respect to lambda and then integrate over our um, coordinate range 0 to 1 to get our free energy change and then we are at thermodynamic integration. Um, so we have perturbation on the left, integration on the right, and um, there is pros and cons to uh, both. Um, so perturbation tends to be slightly more sensitive towards the charge of lambda steps, 
um, we have an equilibration phase uh, prior to the um, production phase for each lambda window that we're interested in and this exponential averaging um, often um, induces an, a systematic um, error if we are not careful. Um, thermodynamic uh, integration is slightly more robust yeah, because we have um, uh, we don't have a discrete sum but we have a, a more fine grained sampling um, but because of that we also must be careful how fast we change our lambda during the simulation in order to make sure that the system has the uh, possibility to, to adapt otherwise uh, we get a Hamiltonian lag that the system sort of lags behind what we are doing with lambda um, um, and, and um, we will come to that uh, in fact with, with non-equilibrium methods in a minute uh, because uh, this is what we would want to avoid here. Uh, Hamiltonian lag would mean that we are introducing non-equilibrium effects in the system uh, which would uh, break the um, formalism of, for example, thermodynamic integration. But in um, non-equilibrium methods we actually make use of these non-equilibrium um, um, dissipation effects. Um, but to complete this list, um, the final uh, advantage, if you wish, of the um, uh, thermodynamic integration over perturbation is that we don't use this exponential averaging, but we have a direct calculation of the derivatives, and therefore are slightly less sensitive to um, numerical issues, perhaps. Okay. Um, so. Um, let's look at uh, a practical example of where we can make use of this formalism. So again, let's um, think about binding and uh, binding of two molecules. One is this uh, green, uh, more triangular molecule, um, and um, it uh, might bind to a receptor um, and uh, um, undergo a conformational change in doing so. Um, we have a different molecule, uh, the blue one, which can bind to the same receptor, maybe in a different pose, we don't know yet. Um, but um, so if we would want to uh, measure this experimentally, we would be looking at the horizontal lags of this cycle, where we would compare the bound state um, to the unbound state and look at the uh, affinity or the free energy of binding, so delta G uh, binding um, uh, here, uh, and uh, we would do that for the uh, green molecule as well as for the blue molecule, and the difference between the two would then be the um, difference in affinity between these two molecules. And in simulation we could do this as well, but we would have to do this with, for example, umbrella sampling or metadynamics in order to um, simulate the whole binding-unbinding process. And this can be cumbersome, and if we're only interested in the difference between the bound and the unbound, we can actually also approach this alchemically, where we then look at the vertical lags of this um, cycle. So we would try to morph the uh, green molecule into the blue molecule, and we would once do this in the unbound state, so there we can actually forget about the protein and just in solvent morph the blue into the green molecule or vice versa. And we would also do the same in the bound state. Um, again, we would transform um, the green molecule into the blue molecule. And now the nice thing is that because this is thermodynamics, um, the uh, it doesn't matter how we complete the cycle, um, the cycle should always um, close. So meaning, it does. if we want to go, for example, from the upper left to the lower right, it doesn't mean which path we take, we should always come up with the same answer. So we can go to the upper right first and then go to the lower right, we can also go to the lower left first and then go to the lower right, it should always add up. And that in turn also means that the sum of the, or the difference between the two horizontal lags that we might be interested in as the difference between binding affinities 
must be the same as the difference between the two vertical legs, uh, which we can approach uh, alchemically. So the difference in binding affinity can be obtained from the difference between the alchemical transformations, one in the bound state, one in the unbound state, without ever having to compute the actual binding unbinding uh, process. And that's the beauty of this method, uh, that we circumvent uh, cumbersome pathways, in this case binding and unbinding, by taking an alchemical transformation that gives us access to exactly the same information. All right, um, yeah, so exactly these uh, vertical legs are um, accessed by uh, perturbation or thermodynamic integration, so alchemically. Another example of such a cycle is if we are interested in uh, protein or peptide folding. And for example, the question would be, now if we introduce a, a mutation, how would it affect the, um, um, the folded versus the unfolded state? So how would it affect the folding process, the folding free energy? This is maybe an even um, more cumbersome pathway to um, uh, approach directly, yeah, because it would involve um, looking at the protein folding and unfolding uh, pathway. We in the very beginning of this lecture, we looked at one example where this happens spontaneously, but this is rather the exception. Frequently, this is a rather um, uh, tough process to simulate. And therefore, um, what we would have to do here would be to look at the protein folding and unfolding for wild type. And then we would have to repeat the exact same thing for the mutant that we're interested in and um, look at the difference in folding free energy. Now, just as with the binding example before, we can look at this as a thermodynamic cycle and also approach it um, um, alchemically. Uh, here the alchemical uh, transformations are now the horizontal ones, so instead of sampling the cumbersome vertical legs of unfolding and folding, we look at the horizontal um, alchemical transformations of mutating the system from an unfolded uh, to a folded, uh, sorry, from a, a wild type to a mutant case. We do that once in the unfolded state, uh, and we do it once in the folded state, and the difference between the two gives us exactly the difference in folding free energy for the mutant uh, as compared to the wild type, uh, which is exactly uh, what we were after in this case. And, um, uh, here we get alchemical information based on um, um, uh, or alchemical information on protein folding. Okay. Um, now, like I said, um, up to now we uh, focused on equilibrium methods, um, free energy perturbation, and um, uh, thermodynamic integration, assuming that the system at all times is in equilibrium. Um, so, be it either in the um, in, in state A or state B, uh, wild type mutant, bound, unbound. Um, um, and um, and the changes that we make are always so slow that we can assume that the system is in equilibrium at all times. Now, what if that's not the case? Um, then, of course, yeah, for example, if we um, um, morph one ligand into another very quickly, or if we mutate um, uh, an amino acid in a protein very quickly from, say, an alanine to a phenylalanine, then uh, what we would be computing is, um, it's, it's um, repeated here, the same formula, so uh, in, in terms of thermodynamic integration, what we would be computing is the um, integral over uh, dH d lambda um, um, by changing lambda. And if we do this slow enough, um, so if we are in equilibrium, this gives us the delta G. If we do it much too fast, then we also have non-equilibrium effects. You know? So like 
friction effects um, um, yeah, by introducing atoms where there is no room. This um, we're dissipating um, extra energy, and therefore we get a contribution uh, in addition to the free energy. So that's why we don't write delta G here uh, anymore, but we write W for work that we need to do, um, uh, which is um, uh, contains a contribution from the free energy, but it also contains a contribution from dissipated non-equilibrium work. Um, now this is um, this complicates things, um, but there is good news, um, and that is um, um, there we can also uh, we can either use the um, uh, so-called Jarosinski framework or the Crookes fluctuation theorem, and that's what we're doing here. And the Crookes fluctuation theorem tells us that, well. Uh, even if we go way too fast and and um, uh, create a non-equilibrium work, if we repeat that process a number of times, we get the so-called work distribution. So here we get um, a, a certain distribution of work values for the forward um, transition in um, uh, blue, and uh, we can do the same thing backwards, so we can also, um, uh, here we do the mutation forward, so we start from the wild type uh, state and we perform a number of mutations very quickly to the mutant state. Um, in addition, we can also simulate the mutant um, uh, uh, do the exact same thing in the reverse direction, so introduce a mutation back to the wild type uh, also collect a number of work values for that and now the Crookes fluctuation theorem tells us that the um, um, probabilities of finding certain work values is does again look a little bit like this Boltzmann formula um, so it's related to the um, uh, delta G and in fact uh, at that value of the work um, that equals the uh, um, delta G, so where this difference between W and delta G becomes zero, this is where the two um, uh, probabilities are equal. So meaning if we look at these two histograms the where they overlap at the, um, uh, the section point, intersection point, um, the um, uh, two uh, probabilities are equal and so this means this would be our estimate for the delta G. Um, and that means we actually have a means of extracting an equilibrium thermodynamic free energy, delta G, from a set of non-equilibrium um, uh, fast transitions. And this is very good news because um, this is something that we have um, uh, easy access to in MD simulations. Um, so this is uh, uh, one actual example from a number of um, uh, snapshots um, derived from an MD simulation. We did a number of forward transitions in um, uh, green, a number of backward transitions in blue. We see that the two distributions are separated from each other, so there is dissipated work, but there is also overlap between the two um, uh, distributions. We can see um, uh, the intersection point, and this is actually the uh, estimate of the free energy in this case, uh, which is rather close to zero. Um, all right, so how can we apply that in practice? Um, I'm going to show two examples, one on uh, the design of inhibitors and another on protein mutations. The um, first one is on thrombin inhibitors, and this is just a quick benchmark um, based on, on known experimental affinities, if that's something that can be reproduced by this um, alchemical non-equilibrium approach. Um, so the thermodynamic cycle that we are looking at looks very similar to what we looked at before. Um, so we compare a bound to an unbound state and then uh, mutate one ligand into the other, and um, um, uh, this is how we approach it in simulations. 
Um, we can in fact also have both the bound and the unbound state in the same simulation box. This also helps if we, for example, have a charge change on the ligand. If we have um, if the bound and the unbound state both in the same box, it means that we can do this change without an actual charge change in the simulations. It helps with, um, yeah, for the experts, this helps with um, uh, particle mesh e -wilds. We can keep the system um, at constant charge, at or zero charge at all times. And yeah, uh, compute um, um, a difference in the uh, binding affinity delta delta G between these two ligands. Um, this is the uh, um, uh, set of results that we got. Um, we have the, um, uh, in the upper left, we have the uh, results as a bar graph, and the uh, um, lower left, we have them as a a scatter plot, but let's first have a look at the upper left um, where we have the um, uh, measured values in orange and the calculated simulation values in cyan or green. And we see that overall there is um, quite a nice um, uh, correspondence. Um, so, whenever um, um, uh, the simulation says that the uh, um, um, a certain compound is a good binder, then uh, in almost all cases also the experiment uh, confirms that this is the case. So all of the um, uh, ligands here are deviations from a, a, a reference ligand that is shown in the inset. And so um, here we have, have looked at, um, at these different um, uh, ligand modifications. In the scatter plot um, in the lower left, uh, we also see the overall correlation. It's not perfect, yeah, we have a correlation of uh, around uh, 0 0.8, uh, but that's overall quite decent. So qualitatively, these kind of simulations tell us if a molecule is a better or worse binder than the reference compounds. Um, and this is all based on these non-equilibrium um, um, alchemical estimates. The second example I want to uh, briefly share with you is an um, example on, on protein mutations and molecular recognition and design. And we're looking here at the uh, protein ubiquitin. Um, and just a, a few words of background on, on how ubiquitin works. Um, ubiquitin is a, a protein tag that associates with quite a, a large number of different proteins in the cell. And therefore, not surprisingly, um, you will find um, examples of ubiquitin in complexes with different um, uh, other proteins uh, in the uh, uh, protein data bank. So just a few examples of those are shown on the right, um, where you see ubiquitin in complex with um, uh, different other proteins. And ubiquitin is always in a slightly different conformation, um, sort of specific for that particular complex. And at the same time, on the left-hand side, we see a solution ensemble of ubiquitin um, reflecting the um, uh, kind of motions that ubiquitin undergoes in solution. And those could be obtained either from simulation, in this case uh, it was uh, obtained from NMR experiments, but the um, um, agreement between NMR and MD was was quite um, was astonishingly high. So you would get the same solution ensemble if you would look at it from simulation or from experiment. But of course, the question is: is the um, um, dynamics that ubiquitin undergoes in solution is that the same type of dynamics that ubiquitin needs? if it wants to engage in these different complexes. Yeah, some of the examples you see on the right. And again, we can look at this with principal component analysis. That's what we see uh, in this plot. Um, and so um, uh, we have here two ensembles projected. One is the solution ensemble in red, and the other is the ensemble of ubiquitin extracted from different um, complex structures from the PDB in black, and already the um, 
correspondence in, in this projection shows that in fact the two ensembles are very similar. Um, we see the uh, main mode of motion or the main mode of how ubiquitin adapts um, to, to engage in different complexes. We see that in the animation. So it's an opening closing kind of pincer like motion. Uh, opening and closing in order to uh, adapt to different um, surfaces that it, it, it engages in. Um, and of course the um, overlap between the bound and the unbound states um, uh, sort of suggests that what might be going on here is in fact conformational selection where a complex selects a ubiquitin uh, structure that it needs um, for for complex formation. So is this in fact what is going on? Well, we can not only simulate uh, ubiquitin free solution, but we can also simulate it in different complexes. And that's what we did here. So we see the same PCA projection now for simulated um, ubiquitin um, free in solution um, in red, so the, the red panel is repeated here uh, many different times and the blue panels are ubiquitin in different complexes. Yeah, you see the PDB codes in, in each of the panels. And there we also see that in the complex sometimes um, ubiquitin is in fact restricted to a more open configuration, sometimes it's restricted in a more closed configuration in some complexes it can open and close just like in the free uh, in the free state in the unbound state so there it's not restricted at all um, but in, in quite uh, a few of the cases it's actually restricted to either the open or the closed state and that gave us the following idea for a, a protein design study and that is so apparently the native ubiquitin can uh, constantly undergo this conformational change between open and closed and then it can form a complex with either proteins that require the open or the closed states in the complex. Now if we would be able by computational design to come up with a mutated ubiquitin that would strongly favor say the open state um, then the hypothesis was that um, uh, maybe we can create a scenario in which uh, ubiquitin is still equally happy to um, uh, engage in a complex um, uh, with a, a, a protein that requires the open state but uh, it would not form complexes anymore with uh, proteins that would require the closed state. So um, what we did is we um, designed something like uh, 112 mutants all in the core of ubiquitin, so we didn't touch the actual interface surface and um, uh, and looked whether they would prefer the open or the closed state or if they would visit either of them like the wild type does. Well, um, in fact many of the mutants that we tested did not show any effect so they would not have any preference for open or closed but we had a handful that had a, a substantial preference for the open state and another few that would prefer the closed state. So those would be interesting to follow up in terms of actual binding. Um, so the first thing we did was actually to follow up with a set of control simulations um, here by Umbrella Sampling, so where we uh, computed the complete opening closing uh, free energy landscape um, in blue we see repeated the um, uh, wild type protein, so it has two minima, one for open, one for closed, um, both almost equally deep. And then we have an, uh, a different panels for the different mutants um, that we had um, predicted to be either open stabilizing or closed stabilizing. And from the alchemical transformation screen and um, they are not all confirmed in this umbrella sampling uh, scheme but there's a number of cases like this L69T um, that strongly prefers a closed state and, and has a strongly destabilized open state uh, 
and there's other examples yeah like for example this i13f where it's exactly the other way around um, as already um, predicted from the alchemical screen and now also confirmed in umbrella sampling that this would be a mutant that strongly stabilizes the open state of the closed state um, now then it becomes interesting to see do they have the expected effect in this scheme of complex formation um, and so let's have a look um, well we have three scenarios on the left we have uh, those mutants um, uh, and complexes that are immediately um, uh, compatible with each other so this um, could be a mutant that stabilizes the closed state uh, with a complex partner that requires the closed state same for open and here we would expect no uh, change in the affinity upon mutation and this is exactly what we see so we have a number of mutants and a number of uh, complex binding partners and we see that um, delta, delta G so the affinity difference due to the mutation is close to zero and uh, we have a, a second category here in the middle um, here the, either the mutation uh, doesn't strongly affect the open close equilibrium or the um, uh, complex binding partner is actually tolerant to both the open and closed state so again here we would expect um, no difference in affinity and this is what we see in the majority of the cases and then we have this interesting category on the right uh, which uh, is the one of incompatible uh, ubiquitin and uh, binding partner so yeah for example ubiquitin locked in the open state where um, the binding partner would require a closed state of ubiquitin or the other way around and here we indeed see on average a much larger um, so positive delta delta g meaning a large destabilization of the complex um, so ex exactly uh, what we had um, hypothesized um, should happen based on our design scheme here um, so destabilization meaning um, no complex formation um, now this is all from simulation so um, of course this is a point where it's also interesting to follow up experimentally so we took some of these um, um, uh, more destabilizing mutants as well as um, a control mutant that did not have a large effect and followed up experimentally what would happen so we looked at the um, ubiquitin um, complex formation with the disc 2 protein um, uh, we had two mutations i13f i36a um, that um, we predicted to be neutral so they should not be expected to have any effect um, a small um, predicted delta delta g um, uh, and also experimentally we had the small delta delta g here we have two predictions one is based purely on the conformational shift of the um, uh, open closed and the other was on the predicted or, or the yeah the, the calculated delta delta g in the actual complex um, but basically gives a very similar answer um, um, on the other hand for the L69S and L69T mutations here on the right uh, we predicted a strong destabilization of the complex and this is also what we found experimentally so this is a nice experimental uh, validation of what we actually get here is a, um, 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 a change in function so a change in, in um, binding affinity on protein-protein complex formation based on a uh, designed conformational shift all right um, I think that's about all what I wanted to share at this point um, uh, but not of course um, without thanking all the people in the team that um, uh, did all the work and that contributed um, heavily to, to the development of the uh, PMX software that is behind all of this as well as the um, uh, working out the uh, concepts and so on so it all started um, by work of Daniel Seliger who is now working at Bernard Ingelheim um, it's um, followed up by Vitas Gapsis and you'll hear the next lecture by him and we'll tell you what 
he has done in the meantime. Uh, and um, uh, Ferenc Jäger, Matteo Aldegi and Martin Werner have also been um, uh, contributing a lot to these um, types of uh, free energy calculations and, and are continuing to do so. All right, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the um, uh, upcoming chat. <laughs>